Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, CAR-T Generation for Identity, Purity, and Potency Assay Testing. Presented by Dr. Tia Hexum, Field Application Scientist, Cell Therapy at Thermo Fisher Scientific. I'm Christy Jewell of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labroots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information on our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that today's event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. Also, please notice you can share this webinar on your personal social media. Just click on the social sharing tab to let your friends and colleagues know about today's live event. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on that support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by using the Ask a Question box. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd now like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Tia Hexum, Field Application Scientist, Cell Therapy for Thermo Fisher Scientific. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Hexum, you may now begin your presentation. Thanks for the introduction, Christy. Today, I want to talk to you guys about CAR-T generation for identity, purity, and potency assay testing. I really just want to give an overview of some of the characterization methods you guys can be using when you're out there developing these cool therapies that are happening right now. So um, by the time you, you know, we've, we've finished presenting this slide, I'm sure these numbers will change. They're constantly changing. Um, but it's a, it's a really cool time to be in cell and gene therapy with a lot of exciting advancement that's happening. So, um, you know, lots of, lots of things in clinical trials. There's seven approved regenerative medicines uh, already approved. Uh, the FDA and EMEA are approving therapies for CAR-T therapies for the field of oncology. Um, also, lots of phase three trials going on, uh, 100, 132 right now. So, but we still have a lot of challenges that remain. There's a complex supply chain issue, logistics of 150 or more vendors that you might have to coordinate. You have to keep up with demand and capacity issues. How many patients do you think you're going to have to treat? How are you going to meet that demand? And then there's still cytokine release syndrome and some other neurological toxicity risks. What I really love about working with Thermo and, and bringing you this information is that we're really uniquely positioned to help you in this market and to make a significant impact to help you with this because uh, we've, we've taken uh, some of these therapies from their initial discovery stages all the way through to commercialization. And so we're here and experienced in being able to help you with that. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys, I have a little bit of a cold. So pardon my, pardon my <clears throat> clearing my throat sometimes. So. Uh, in cell and gene therapy, there's a, there's a number of industry challenges. I'm going to go over a, a broad view of this, and then I really want to focus on a, a few critical things. So you have the quality and logistics, some of that stuff that I talked about before. The speed of the innovation and it going to market is very rapid. It's some of the rapid, uh, most rapid timing we've seen. The cost, uh, it's still uh, very expensive to do, and we're always trying to drive down the cost of goods. And there's a lot of regulatory compliance and documentation you really need to consider. During today's web, uh, webinar, I'd really like to focus on some of the advanced analytical tools to help you with um, defining your process and, and the product QC that you might do. So one thing that's really important to understand when it comes to cell and gene therapy is that uh, we're defining the process as much as we're defining the cell therapy. So um, while you're manufacturing the cell therapy or the um, the gene therapy, depending on what you're doing, uh, there's a lot of in-process monitoring and testing that occurs. So it's 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 really your your entire cell therapy. You're characterizing the process as much as that endpoint, like I just just said. So it's critical to be able to understand and monitor the therapy as you go throughout the process itself, as well as what your defined release criteria is at the end when you're administering it back into the patient. <clears throat> so I, I don't want you guys to, I also want to remind you that there's a broader 
background of characterization. It's not just identity, purity, and potency like we classically think about it. Um, it also is manufacturing, consistency, and safety. Um, which purities or impurities do you have? And these are really important things to consider as well. Don't just don't get too myopic in focusing on the identity, purity, and potency. There's more to it. Uh, like I said, because you know the recipe I make in my kitchen, if I if I'm gonna use an analogy of having a kitchen and a recipe for the cell therapy, the the way that I make a specific recipe might be different from the way you make a specific recipe, and so that's why we need to remember that. Um, that whole process is something to characterize, as well as the fact that, um, you know, the end result might be quite different as well. <clears throat> so how do we really look at uh, these, these analytical tools and help to create them and define them and bring them into something that is what we'll be using to define our, our cell therapy in the end? So the assays in general are developed in stages. So when you're in your preclinical stages, you're going to be developing what is the assay um, what am I measuring? Does this really work? Uh, <clears throat> by the time you're in phase one and phase two, you're going to be uh, really developing it and seeing if it can stand up to the eight qualities that are important in quality um, assays. And that precision, is it precise? Is it accurate? Does it have a limit of detection? Does it have a limit of quantification? Is it specific for what I'm measuring? Is it rugged? Is it robust? And is it linear and giving me a range, a clear range? So these are all things that are really important to make sure that you're actually measuring what you intend to be measuring. Is your assay fit for purpose? By phase three of the assay, you should, uh, or by phase three of your clinical trials, you should have an assay that is uh, completely validated and fit for purpose. And what, you know, what we mean when we say fit for purpose is, is it able to predict what it's really measuring? So what we did here with our scientists in the lab is we took an integrated approach to make a CAR-T therapy to, to do some of these measurement tools to really validate what, what it is that we have um, that we sell on the market to you. So we, we started with PBMCs. We did an untouched isolation using our DynaBeads. Um, we did a CD3 T cell isolation. This is uh, important because we're making CAR-Ts here. And so um, with those CAR-Ts, we, we then um, put them in, in <clears throat> culture, excuse me, in culture for uh, a couple of days with our CTS, um, CTS DynaBeads for activation of the T cells, as well as using our optimizer and immune cell serum replacement as the culture media. After a couple of days, we exposed them to lentivirus, which was created in our uh, CTS LVMAX lentiviral production system. And what this lentivirus is doing, I'll remind you guys uh, who are um, a little bit new to the CAR-T workflow, the lentivirus is doing a genetic editing um, and inserting a CAR. And these CARs are used for fighting different diseases. So the, the commercialized one right now are blood cancers, but a lot of the researchers out there are doing lots of different kinds of cool stuff with gene editing these tools. But we just took a really simple car um, using the LV. And then after, after we did the transduction and gene editing of the car into the T cell, we then expanded them with CTS optimizer, um, L-glutamine, glutamax, IL-2, immune cell serum replacement, and grew those up for five to 10 days. So this is typically a process that lasts one to two weeks based on the methodology or the recipe that you use um, in your lab or in your manufacturing facility. Uh, and, and although there's a general workflow, there's a lot of nuances and differences between the different uh, therapies that are on the market and being developed. And so I just wanna highlight a couple of broad areas where quantification is required and uh, where you can think about some of the analytical solutions that you can be using throughout this. <clears throat> so, you know, I'll go into more detail with these, but cell line authentic authentication, identity and purity, potency, microbial testing, and viral safety are all analytical solutions that you'll want to consider as you're going throughout this entire process. So, of, of the experiments that we ran in the lab and the cars that we made, we made it in three different donors. And the first thing we wanted to do is make sure that the cells we started with and the cells we ended with came from the same donor. One of the largest uh, costs when it comes to the manufacturing of a commercial product is making sure that what you, you start with and end with 
are the same patient. Obviously, you don't want to treat somebody with somebody else's cells, right? So here's a simple tool that you can use. So one of the reasons why it's most expensive is because there's been a lot of caution put into play with making you know, one patient per one manufacturing room in the GMP suite. But here's another alternative to part of that safety, and that's a molecular tool used to, to uh, make sure that the patient you started with and the patient you ended with are the same patient. So as you can see here, we used our Applied Biosystems Identifier PCR Amplification Kit. This is an STR-based methodology. It looks at multiple loci to identify multiple donors for each other and make, to differentiate them and to make sure that what you started with is what you ended with using the DNA fingerprinting of the, of the, the donor that contributed the material. Um, this is the same technology that's used in human identification and criminal labs. So um, this is the first thing that we did to make sure that uh, we were analyzing and looking at ourselves in the correct way. And another thing that I'd like to talk to you about now is about immune cell phenotyping. So identity and purity assessment of immune cells. There was a workshop that was held and looked at the characterization of cell products and where's the need, what are we doing, where's the need for improvement. So as you can see on the right hand side of this slide, there was a, a large um, response of needing improvement in cell count and viability, functional um, tests such as potency assay and in vitro differentiation, as well as flow cytometry. So we have these standard workhorses that have been part of the part of the solution for a long time, but the, there's also this um, consensus that we, we need to be improving some of these tools as well. So I'm going to get into a few of the challenges that exist in flow cytometry, for example. So flow cytometry is still the workhorse method. It's still um, the most utilized and gold standard, and it has some advantages and disadvantages. And so I want to talk to you today about what those advantages are, why we might consider using flow, and why we might consider adopting a new, a new technology of looking at molecular immune uh, phenotyping or uh, immune assessment and characterization of our cells. So flow is, a, is great because it's got the gold standard. However, the challenge is that the antibodies, um, how the antibodies are made and how they're available can create a problem. Sometimes you need to do bridging studies between lots of antibodies. So if I measure, I measure the 10 patients between uh, January and June and they use this lot of antibody, let me make sure that the next lot of antibody comes out is, a, is an accurate control for June through December, right? So you have to do a bridging study and make sure that the antibodies you use <clears throat> are providing consistent results so you don't get variability in the, the most critical data that you need to analyze, and that's the patient response. Um, it can be very difficult to train and, and um, bring, bring people on that, that know and are comfortable with utilizing this tool. So um, it takes a lot of training. And, you know, back when I worked in the lab, we, we sometimes we would have one sample and three of us would run the same sample and get quite different results. So it can be difficult and subjective on, on how these, these, um, these results come out. And so that's a challenge too, especially if you're doing clinical trials where you have different labs measuring these same, same um, metrics. So, you know, lab to lab comparison or person to person comparison can be difficult as well. Also, sometimes you might need to stimulate the cells to, in order for the markers to be able to see them. And um, if you're doing any kinds of surface ant antigens that are not abundantly expressed on the target shells, or if you have residual expression on control cells, there may be difficulty in rendering uh, the, the clear separation for your flow. Um, additionally, some of the new cell therapies that are coming out are using therapeutic antibodies in the in the part of the treatment as well. And so that can also uh, make it not as clear of a result when you're when you're looking at these things. So um, with that, I'm going to I'm going to talk to you about the flow tools that we have that can help with that standard workhorse method. And then in a couple of slides, I want to show you a new tool that's really exciting that we have that can help with some of these pain points that I've just descri described to you. So at Invitrogen, we have eBioscience, which is a, is a wonderful um, 
we have a wonderful history of having really good flow antibodies that are validated and consistent. Uh, they have good quality and chemistry and standard behind it. And so what we did is we wanted to make this a little bit simpler for people in the, in the RT workflow or people doing Tregs or other kinds of immune phenotypes, we wanted to give them a flow panel that would make it uh, an, an easy to run thing to reduce some of the variability. So have proven performance, make sure you have a highly referenced antibody. We have a number of um, different uh, references that are associated with this, so it gives you confidence in the results. And we wanted to really provide a turnkey kit and protocol. So um, with these phenotyping kits, we, we have a couple of different kinds. We have ones for CD3, we have ones for Treg, and we have ones for TH17. And so these panels come with pre-packed pre antibodies that give you the typical flow that you might want to see. And so we did this on our CAR T cells. We used this same um, cell phenotyping kit. So as you can see here in, this, in the, a couple of the donors that we tested, you can see the, the data that we achieved. So we have CD3 on the left-hand side. We have the CD4, CD8 ratio. We're looking at the, you know, the, naive, the stemness or the naive, uh, naiveness of the cells with CD62L, CCR7, and, and, and the third set of graphs. And then we're also looking at the isotype in the last set of graphs. And that's just really showing that I have a good quality negative control. So as you can see, um, we have a, a really nice standard flow panel that makes it easy for you um, to have some more consistency between, between labs. And we also provide gating strategies and some of the tools that you'll need to, to make sure that you feel confident that you're running something consistent between the groups in your lab. So as I promised you, I also want to talk to you about an, a cool tool that we can look at the, the immune cell type um, using a molecular-based method. So we have a new tool uh, in a partnership with Epionis using, applied, using our Applied Biosystems CTS pure quant assay kits. And this is a, is a really cool new, new PCR-based tool that gives you a lot more consistency between uh, what some of the challenges are when it comes to flow. So this gives you, um, first of all, you don't have to have fresh, fresh products. So when you're at the end of your 12-day Treg isolation process. You don't have to spend another two hours in the lab, or you know, if you have a different, if you're working with CAR Ts, what what have you, you don't have to spend those extra couple hours in the lab. You can freeze the sample, um, and it also makes it easier for doing analysis between different clinical trial sites. So you have that ability to not have to work with live tissue. It's a molecular-based assay, so it gives you better results for quantification, and I'll go a little bit more into that in a minute. Um, it, it helps with uh, regulatory filing as well. It's developed in adherence of the ICH Q2R1 guidelines uh, that have the eight levels of validation that I talked to you about when it comes to validating assays. Um, and of course, you still need to validate it that it's fit for your purpose, but uh, it's a great tool for looking at the epigenetics of the, the immune cells that are being used in your lab. So let's talk more about exactly how this is working. So um, there was a, a, a long time of validating this process, um, and we can go more into that on the side. We can talk about that on the side, not in this webinar. But what's really cool about this is these pure quant assays are taking the phenotype. So instead of in flow, you're measuring the receptor on the surface. In this one, we're going to measure the unmethylation, the demethylation of specific um, DNA in your cell. So we all have, all cells have the same DNA, right? <clears throat> depending on how that DNA is expressed, um, you know, translated, translated, transcribed, and expressed in your cell depends on how your cell will perform. So um, that's the cool thing about this tool is it's looking at that, that recipe and saying in the specific place, the DNA is unmethylated, therefore the DNA is being transcribed and actively expressed. And so that's going to give me a clear indication of the cell phenotype. And so um, the way that we can... Uh, utilize this, uh, this biological mechanism of unmethylating the DNA when it's being expressed is we have, uh, we're utilizing um, a bisulfide conversion. So in your, in your DNA, the ones that are unmethylated will have a C and the methylated will have a C2. But when we do the bisulfide conversion, that allows us to get the resolution that we need 
to, to show the specific areas that are being expressed. And so in this, this kit here, if it's unmethylated, it'll become a U, and if it's methylated, it'll remain a C. And that has to do with the, the methylation um, that, that's being expressed. So based on this, you can tell if the, the DNA is open and being transcribed and then get a better phenotype. So, I mean, this Epionis spent a lot of time developing what that signature was for these immune cell types. It, it took development and years of validation. Um, but what's cool is we now have that as a tool so that we can utilize it to look at the immune cell expression that's happening in the population of cells that we have um, made into CARS. So in our three donors that we utilized for this, the purpose of this webinar, we, we examined CD3, CD4, CD8, Treg, TH17, B cells, and monocytes. So there are articles out there that talk about B cells and monocytes being common contaminators in the CAR-T product. And so this is um, a way for us to look at, can we get the resolution we want? And so you can see here the quantification of the expression of those different cell populations in our donors. But let's just dig a little bit deeper here. So, um, excuse me for a moment. So the way that we wanted to, so what I want to explain to you is that this is designed for release testing. So it comes with some of those, remember the eight qualities that I talked to you about a couple of slides back that are important for validation and, and making sure that the assay that you're making, um, utilizing has been examined and fit for purpose for you. So some of the designs that are important in using, <coughs> excuse me, analytical tools is to make sure you have calibration. Does, does it correct for the qPCR assay specific performance? So like between the time when I ran it on Monday and the time I ran it on Friday, am I getting something consistent? I need a calibrator, make sure I'm measuring with the same measuring stick. You'll need a reference to check for the assay performance, making sure that is my assay working today? Um, and then you'll want a standard. So the standard is there to help you determine the copy number. So what's really cool about the methylation tool is we know that there's a certain amount of, of DNA places where this is um, expressed. And so this gives us a, a clear uh, mechanism for quantifying the number of cells that are actually in the population measured. So um, <clears throat> one of the other things that's really important that I talked to you about um, on the earlier slide is making sure that you have a limit of blank, a limit of detection, and a limit of quantification. So what we did in our lab is we prepared the standard DNA as per the protocol. Then we serially diluted it with 40, 20, 10, five copies in blank. Uh, then we took 10 replicate, replicates of each of these data points to really assure ourselves that we, we have the, the ability to measure what we think we're measuring. The so limit of blank, obviously we wanna see a consistent zero there because that's blank. We don't want anything to show up there. Um, limit of detection would be the bottom number that we are confident in. And the limit of quantification would be where we're confident, 95% confidence that this is the, the range that we can detect um, in our sample population. So um, in addition to that, so you have all those references and, and quality standards that make it a good analytical tool. We also wanted to show the, you know, the differences between flow and what happened when you use the qPCR um, method that we're describing here with the pure quant. And so a really cool, I, I love the study that they created here. That what they did is they're gonna spike in a number of contaminants. And so they ha we have a million cells in our sample um, here, and they, we either spiked in 100,000, 50,000, 10,000, or zero of the contaminating population. And then the two, the two people in the lab analyzed this one with flow and one with pure quant, not talking to each other at the same time, um, and then compared results at the end. And so in this spike in experiment, you can see on the bottom left graph where we have our standard curve and um, see the nice linearity that you would expect being able to, um, what you can be able to detect. Um, and then you're comparing it to your housekeeping gene gap DH there. And the flow cytometry, it was really difficult for that member of our lab to, to um, carefully gate and make sure that he was confident in what his analysis was, what his results were. And so some of the results, you know, when you're getting over to the right-hand side, so we're, I'm in the top graph here in the flow graph, 
you, if you get to the right hand side when you're at 0.85 percent most of the people i know that run flow they're they're not going to feel confident in a result like that right and so there's there's a limit of where your confidence is going to be when it comes to this flow um gating and so <laughs> but what's really cool is he did that gating and then our QPCR analyst did the, the analysis using our pure quant, and they got really similar results. But <clears throat> what's, what's different about the pure quant is we feel very confident because we have specific copy numbers that we can, we can utilize there. So we feel very confident in those results. And so you can see when we spiked in 10% of contaminating B cells, we got around you know, 6.3, 6.5% readback. Um, and, and vice versa. And so that gives you a lot of um, confidence in the, in the test itself, uh, as well as showing you some of the, the pluses and minuses of using the two different ones, the two different metrics here for analysis. So um, when it comes to what you think about when you're trying to decide between flow or qPCR-based methods, there's a couple of things to think about. Um, you know, so if you're using flow, you might want, when it comes to flow, you'd want to think about, you know, when you're casting a wide net. If you think, I'm not exactly sure how the drug that I'm developing is modulating the immune system, so I'm going to cast a wide net. I'll use uh, multiple flow panels to reduce so that I can see what my specific uh, signature is. Or if you have receptor occupancy that you want to see the particular cell surface marker and how many of them have been engaged or if you want to see a change in activation state with something phosphorylated or a specific protein utilized. Those are times when flow is very advantageous. On the other hand, when it comes to the epigenetic immune cell quantification, you would want to consider using the pure quant assay for precise quantification and depletion or reconstitution of specific cell types, um, ex especially if you've been using depleting antibodies. You'll want to utilize it for immune phenotyping for a large number of samples. And then immune cell uh, profiling when they have solid tissues. So if extraction of viable cells is particularly challenging, like in a solid tumor, <coughs> excuse me, you would want to utilize this because you don't have to have the live cells. So pure quant would be really advantageous for that uh, component as well. Also immune cell profiling when you have multiple centers and multiple sites where you're doing this. This allows you to have many remote locations and have, you know, isolation and shipment to have it all run in the same place, or you can have consistency between the labs uh, together. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to transition now to move on to another um, assay that's utilized in the CAR T therapy workflow. And that's a functional assay, which really looks at did the CAR T's I made, were, are they able to sell, to, to kill their, their target cell population? So here, we made the CAR Ts according to the workflow I told you about earlier, and we exposed them. So these CARs are against uh, have a CD19 um, uh, for their CAR, and so they're going to attack a CD19 expressing cell. So we had K562 cells uh, in co-culture with them expressing CD19, and when these these cells are um, exposed to each other. If the CAR-T is functional and working, as I hope it should be after I've spent all this time culturing them, it will kill the cell and start to lyse it. And in that lysing and killing of the cell, you'll have release of lactate dehydrogenase, or LDH. When that LDH is expressed, we can then monitor that and measure that as a, something that shows the functional killing. So you, typically, you do different ratios of your CAR to your to your uh, cancer mimicking cell here, which is CD19K562. And you can see that the cars that we made had, um, they did effectively kill the K562 cells. Um, and this is another assay that we have here at Thermo Fisher for you to <coughs> analyze that. So when these CAR Ts are killing, one of the ways that they kill is with cytokines um, and chemokines. And so a lot of times what I've seen in the, in the publications and the articles out there with what's going on in cell therapy is that we're finding specific phenotypes and, and fingerprints um, characterizing the, the cell types that are being made because there's a lot of things going into it. Is my cell functional? Are they potent? Can they kill? But how long are they persisting to? And so some of the responders that they're seeing in the patient populations and non-responders, they're looking at a lot of these uh, these assays to see if they can find specific fingerprints for why it worked or why it didn't work. 
And so one of the other ways you might want to do that is by looking at the specific cytokine and chemokine fingerprint that the cells that you're creating are making. And so uh, we have an in vitro gen cytokine and chemokine 34 plex hum human protocart, excuse me, cartoplex panel using the Luminex platform. Excuse me, guys. <laughs> of course, no one plans on getting sick for their webinar, right? So <clears throat> excuse my voice. So by looking at this, you can really identify the specific cytokines that have been released into the media. So what happens is we expose, so sorry for the busyness of the panel, but I just want to really show you fingerprinting here. So we're exposing the CAR Ts to the CD19 K562 cells. We're incubating it for 16 hours and then using the Luminex assay and looking at the supernate. And we're going to look at what those specific fingerprints are for the cell types that we came up with. Are they effector cells? Are they stimulatory? Are they chemoattractive or are they regulatory? And so, as you can see here, we did that readout for our CAR-T um, donors uh, to see what their specific signature was when we ran it. So I've, I've talked to you a lot about some of the ways that we can look at the identity, some of the ways we can look at purity, and some of the ways we can look at functionality, some of those uh, early tools that I talked to you about for um, the tools that we can use. But I also want to talk to you about, you know, contamination in in your assay. So how do I make sure that what I've been manufacturing, I don't know if you have a closed or an open system that you're working with over there. Chances are you have a little bit of a mix. You want to make sure that the cells that you've made are safe to go back into the patient. So one of the, the common contaminations that we want to look for is mycoplasma. And so uh, at Thermo Fisher, we have the Applied Biosystems MycoSeq Mycoplasma Detection Kit. So this is a regulatory accepted method. It's been accepted in EMEA and FDA with a number of different tissue, uh, cell, gene therapy, and uh, vaccines that are already using this as an approved method for testing uh, mycoplasma in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the culture. So typically in the past, before this was uh, available and approved, you would have to spend 28 days in, uh, in culture, having your mycoplasma being expressed, and then you test it later. But when you have a living drug like we do in some of these therapies, you don't always have 28 days. Besides the fact that sometimes in the autologous cell therapies, the patients are really sick. They might not have another 28 days to wait for that, for that drug to be cleared and approved. So we set out to look for a way that we could um, <clears throat> give you the results and confidence in your results to make sure you don't have mycoplasma contamination in as little as five hours. So we took that, that pain point of waiting for 28 days and made it into an assay that you can run in five hours. And so um, this detection kit, we ran it on our cells, of course, to confirm that the cells, the CAR Ts that we made in the lab were negative for mycoplasma as you can see on the right over here. So there's 90 different strains and species that are uh, a part of the kit. Where uh, on the right-hand table, you can see that all of the cars that we made were negative. And so this is just giving us another assurance that the product that we made, you know, we had the identity, we had the purity of it, we had the functionality, is it killing? We had the fingerprinting of the chemokine and the um, <clears throat> cytokines being used. And now we're looking at is it something that's safe? Do I have contamination? No, there's no mycoplasma contamination. So I hope that I've given you some, some of the tools that are useful for that broad overview for when you're manufacturing cars for autologous therapies. I'm going to pivot and transition a little bit to talk about some of the newer stuff that's useful when it comes to allogeneic as well as autologous. So the part of the workflow that I focused on Kind of broadly because you know we're all making different recipes in our kitchen i was talking a little bit specifically about autologous there's another another version of making cars which is allogeneic so part some of the pain points that exist with autologous when it's coming from the patient and going back into the patient so sometimes these patients are quite sick and they don't have a um their their t-cells don't always expand so that was one of the most recent things that i was reading in a publication is depending on the expansion um of the cars, sometimes that would predict or indicate if there was going to be a response or a non-responder um, to the treatment. Additionally, um, sometimes they're not healthy enough to even get leukophoresis, and so you might have to have a change in your raw material to use whole blood instead of a leukopack. Um, so there's a number of different challenges besides the, the cost can also be very expensive if you're making a bespoke uh, treatment for the patient, so this autologous. So people have been looking at allogeneic. Can I take a healthy donor? Can I make? Can I remove some of the the dangers that exist, like graft versus host disease, rejection, different stuff like that? Can I make CAR T cells from that? 
and have something that's an off the shelf product ready to go. So the minute that, you know, somebody gets diagnosed that they can have this available as a treatment that they can receive almost immediately rather than waiting those two weeks. <clears throat> and in addition, I talked to you a little bit about the cost of goods. So autologous, since it's a therapy that's bespoke specifically for that person, um, you have a higher cost of goods. And then if you have a failure in your manufacturing process, you fail to treat that patient. So that's another another deterrent or um, disadvantage to using autologous therapy. In allogeneic, you know, you can see the cost of good um, calculation that was done here. You can see the reference below. Uh, they, they estimate that because you can make it in a bigger batch and do more validation uh, and stuff like that and have it ready off the shelf to go, that you can drive the cost of goods down quite dramatically to be less than $5,000 a dose compared to $95,000, $96,000 per dose. <clears throat> so um, I want to talk to you a little bit about this emerging trend and some other tools we have um, that might contribute to characterization if you're thinking about allogeneic as the workflow that you're working with. So one of the emerging trends when it comes to the allogeneic T cells is taking a T cell, taking blood cells from the donor, um, making them into induced pluripotent stem cells, doing genetic editing. Um, either sometimes it's to remove MHC class, uh, you know, sometimes it's to remove T cells and, and make them only express CARs. There's different, different strategies out there, but gene editing nonetheless. So gene edit the T cells, or I'm sorry, the, the pluripotent stem cells, and then take those and differentiate them back into T cells and inject them into a patient. And so we have a number of different tools that can be utilized in this whole workflow, as you can see them listed over here on the left. I'm going to talk to you really high level about it um, and how you might be thinking about um, using these tools if this is one of the emerging trends that you're looking at or investigating. So the first thing that you need to do, besides some of the tools that I've talked to you about before, like making sure that the cells you start with are the cells you end with, one of the things uh, that's really important is reprogramming. Do you have a, a, me a mechanism for reprogramming that doesn't leave a f fingerprint um, or a footprint of, of the uh, reprogramming mechanism and is it something that's safe. So we have <clears throat> Cytotune 2.0, which is our research use only kit. We developed a CTS Cytotune 2.1, and this is using Sendai virus as a reprogramming mechanism that, uh, can you, that you can utilize to do the, the footprint-free reprogramming. I have a whole nother webinar on that that, that I dive into it much deeper. So if you'd like to hear more about that, please uh, consult that webinar. What's important about this is that we, we know that you can uh, reprogram a number of different cells. So we, we have workflows to help you with T cells, CD34, or fibroblasts, depending on what your starting cell population is. One of the ways that we made the Cytotune 2.1 a safer, a safer tool for doing the pluripotency uh, induction or the reprogramming is we replaced CMIC with LMIC. We removed any animal components and we make sure that it's manufactured in a GMP facility. We've also done some work in-house to look at how can you um, kind of play with some of the, the, the protocols for making T cells um, or induced pluripotent cells from T cells. And we've seen that hypoxic conditions actually help drive efficiency of the reprogramming up. <clears throat> we compared laminin versus vitronectin. Um, we also did a little bit of work on, you know, looking at if my T cells are exhausted, if I have higher expression of exhaustion in the T cell markers, I actually, interestingly, get a higher uh, reprogramming efficiency for that. We also looked at, is there a difference between if I do negative isolation versus positive isolation? Didn't see a really big change there, but we did see a little bit in increase if you have positive isolation cells. So this is just some of the work that we've done in-house to support you. Would this be a tool that you'd want to use? What's really great about this as well is we have the Sendai quantification kit. So I, I told you you'd want to make sure that when you're doing this uh, induction, this reprogramming, that you'd want to make sure it's something that doesn't leave a footprint over time so that it's that Sendai virus or that virus that you've used to do that no longer exists when, when you have the cells that you're going to be utilizing for um, making your therapy downstream and injecting back into the human. So we've taken some of the PBMCs uh, that we made into iPSCs and measured the Sendai virus expression. So as you can see on the bottom left, after passage four, six, and 10, we have complete removal of the, of the footprint 
of that fungi virus. And so you can have good, uh, con- you can have good confidence that you've removed uh, the IPSC inducing fungi virus to make sure that your your are safe and that you can go on um, to utilize them for what you have planned for the therapy downstream. So if you're doing what I talked about uh, where you're taking T cells, you might also want to do a couple of other uh, tools. So we've talked about this in a different webinar. So you might confirm pluripotency, karyotyping, safety, and identity, which I'll briefly go over just to remind you. But I really want to focus on how you might also want to look at the immune repertoire and the HLA typing um, and the onco, oncomine genetic screen. So uh, when you're making PSC banks, you want to make sure that um, you're testing the identity, purity, and suitability throughout the process. So after you do the induction, um, you know, when you saw them, make sure that you have all of the robustness of the quality assays that we've talked about before. Do you have specificity, linear, linearity, range, accuracy, precision? Um, and is it something that has limit of detection, limit of blank, limit of quantification? And so uh, the qualification of PSC cell banks that's really important, and we provide for you three different um, quantitative or three different tools, molecular based tools to do that. <clears throat> like I said, we've talked about this before, so I just want to give you a brief overview. You want to make sure that the cells that you've uh, reprogrammed are actually pluripotent. So we have a pluritest, um, which is a machine learning model uh, of pluripotency based on global transcriptome assays. So it's a highly validated tool and something that you can use to make sure that the cells that you uh, created are pluripotent. You'll also want to make sure that the cells you've created have the ability to differentiate into the cells you want. So we have the scorecard panel. It's a 93 gene expression assay with simple to use cloud-based data analysis software. And that'll just show you, yes, I can make all the different three, the three different uh, lineage potential if I differentiate downstream. You'll also want to make sure that you have genomic stability. So we have digital karyotyping and uh, genotyping in a single assay with karyostat or karyostat HD assay um, available for, for these sorts of things. In addition, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the TCR uh, beta profiling. So one thing we found when we were taking T cells or, um, and, and reprogramming them, we found that we actually got a population. We were surprised about this. We got a population of cells that were not uh, showing to be T cell derived. Um, <laughs> so we, we found it to be really important as we continued to do this work to, to look at if we had TCR, if we really had clonal, clonal populations that we had picked. <clears throat> and so what we've done here is we have the donor T cells on the top, uh, the top left. You can see we've looked at the TC, um, TCR beta, so the T cell receptor beta um, genotype showing a heterogeneous T, you know, T cells that are present. And then from there, when you're making your clones, you'll want to pick one that's a homogeneous clone. And so, um, you know, on the bottom left, you can see a clone that was derived from a homogenous tool. And so, uh, you know, approximately what was surprising for us is approximately a third of the T cell derived IPSCs were not T cell derived. Another third were non-clonal and then another third were clonal. And so you want to do the sequencing and we think it's critical to ensure that you have the clonal population of T cell induced pluripotent um, stem cells. And so that might be another really important test for you to, to make sure that the clone that you have is, uh, has a TCR and it's homogenous in nature. Um, yep, so that's another critical component you might think about as well. <clears throat> in addition to this, some of the things that are important when it comes to allogeneic work is you might wanna have some HLA profiling that happens. So, you can get graft versus host disease if you have HLA incompatibility. Like I said, some people have different strategies. Some people are erasing this completely with their gene editing. Um, some people are trying to match it from donors. There, there are um, strategies out there for doing bone marrow transplant, but saving some of the HSCs from here and making cars from the HSCs. So there's a number of different strategies that are being used out there in the cell therapy world. But we want to give you, uh, you know, a kit that you can use to really look at the HLA profiling as well. And so we have a LinkSeq HLA kit, and this will give you the low-resolution two-digit Q 
qPCR HLA typing. So as you can see from some of the cells that we made, we either made from a fibroblast or from the T cell that we had matching HLA typing um, uh, for, for our cells there. <clears throat> so that really gives us, not matching, excuse me, but that gives us an idea of what kind of HLA typing is there. <clears throat> and so that helps us know, um, you know, if the donor cells and the IPSC derivatives, if they, if they have the same HLA typing or say you want to treat allogeneic somebody else, you that gives you a lot of information on what might be um, a good me mechanism for making sure you have the matching there. You might also want to check for um, cancer hotspots. So we have an Oncomine comprehensive. So after you've done some of this reprogramming, you want to make sure that you don't have, that you haven't induced cancer hotspots. Some of the, the risk that's happened in the past with different gene, gene therapies or gene editing is that uh, there was concerns about uh, onco, oncogenic um, genetic mutations. And so what we've done is we also offer an Oncovine uh, comprehensive assay to make sure that you don't have any hot spots um, when you're doing this uh, genetic editing and manipulation. So I hope that I've shown you in today's webinar a couple of different things. I hope I've shown you how you can think about some of the tools we have for autologous therapy some of the tools we have for if you're going down the allogeneic route, some things that we've learned in the lab that we would caution you and suggest that you think about using as quality assays. And then, you know, overall, I also just want to give you a larger overview of the, the products and assays that are designed for translation. I, I promised you at the beginning that Thermo Fisher is uniquely positioned to help you in this. And part of the way that we're uniquely positioned to help you in this is, is based on the quality that we really bring to the table. And so, we want to give you assays that are consistent and high quality, reliable, and scalable supply. Um, so we pre-qualify our products. We have 21 CFR compliance, ISO 13485. <clears throat> so that helps to reduce the amount of time and resources that you need to do when it comes to material qualification when you're applying for regulatory support. We also uh, want to focus on characterization and safety. We have a comprehensive and scalable characterization, extensive QC testing for safety. And, um, and and you'll think about those kinds of things uh, when, when you're working with your cells. And then we also want to uh, provide you with platforms that are easy translation. So we have a lot of products that are easy to use from research use only into the CTS branding, which is more for the regulatory support you need when it comes to um, filing for cell and gene therapy uh, approval. And so when you do transition to that CTS branding, we are able to offer you documentation um, and support when it comes to that. So drug master file, certificate of origin, certificate analysis, those types of things. So uh, talk to your, your sales rep or your, your representative that's in your area about the, the products that you can use that are RUO to CTS uh, easy translation for you. <clears throat> you know, a lot of the tools that I talked to you about today they're kind of complex and a little bit daunting. It's like, well, Tia, I don't know if I can really put the resources out there to bring some of these quantification or quali qualitative tools into my into my lab. I don't I don't want to buy the instrument. I don't want to spend the time to get somebody up and running on this. Is there any way that you can help me in another way? And the answer to that is yes, we can. If you uh, if you don't want to have some of these services or some of these tools in your lab, but you want to run some of these tests, we do have the option to help you with custom services. So we have that when it comes to viral services, cell models, cell engineering, and assay development. And there's a there's a number of things listed there. Lots of lots of cool, exciting tools. Um, so if some of this seems like it's too much to bring on, but you still want to run it for <clears throat> for your information uses or how how have you talk to us. We're here to support you with those custom services as well. And as I, I do love to remind everyone that I talked to about this, you know, Thermo Fisher is able to do all of this stuff because we innovate with a partnership with you guys. We're only able to offer these tools. A lot of them have been developed in collaboration with people uh, outside uh, and outside of industry. And so we want to partner with you to create next generation technologies. Um, as well as to help build commercial infrastructure for those people that are getting closer to commercialization. So we're here to partner with you. We want to partner with you. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, and with that, I'll pause and, and ask for any questions. Thank you for your time.
Thank you, Dr. Hexum, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Dr. Hexum, our first question is, how safe is the use of lentivirus during the modification of T cells into CAR Ts? Well, that's a great question. So um, safety is one of those things that you definitely need to be thinking about uh, when you're working in cell therapy and developing that. So uh, what's, what's really interesting is immune cells, they are made, they're a part of our body, and they're supposed to be fighting anything that naturally uh, edits our genes like viruses. And so uh, in the past, T cells are so robust in not being edited that it wasn't until um, HIV came around that we found something that could effectively uh, edit T cells. And so HIV was the first time that we saw that you could genetically program T cells, although in nature with HIV it was for, for a bad thing. And so, but part of what we learned during the process of learning about HIV and trying to cure it is we learned different molecular um, mechanisms and tool, tool, like pieces of the gene tool editing that we could then hijack and, and utilize for a purposeful good use, right? And so what we came up with is three different generations of, of taking pieces of that, that machinery that we know that they were effectively using and making that into something that we, we could use for the public good. And so lentivirus, the current lentivirus that's mostly used <clears throat> is a third generation where we take different components of different uh, things from nature that naturally gene edit uh, T cells, so viruses and what have you, many different viruses, and we take the components of the machinery that, that we know that we can utilize to hijack that, um, that, that gene editing and put that into the T cell. And so, um, you know, third generation, we're trying to make it safer. And so one of the things that they've done with the machinery is make it so it can't repli replicate itself and make more virus um, in the future. And so that's one of the safety mechanisms they use. There's also different mechanisms that people are looking into to get away from viruses completely. So whether that be electroporation, giving an electric shock to, to disrupt the cell membrane or um, other, other types of um, ways to gene edit as well. So CRISPR is another thing that you'll see out there, but there's, a, there's many different ways that you can edit the CAR Ts and that are being investigated. And lentivirus is the classic one because it was the, the one that we finally found the machinery necessary to, to be able to edit these really robust cell types because, you know, the ones that are supposed to fight should never be, you know, impacted by the things that they're fighting, but we were able to hijack that machinery here. Thank you, Dr. Hexum. Our next question, which of the products covered is CTS grade versus RUO? Okay, that's a great question. So what we've done um, in a lot of our development uh, for the tools that we have provided for you, so some of the products I showed you are RUO only, <clears throat> and some of that just has to do with the, that you need to validate them as fit for purpose or they might be more useful for in informational use only. So, because a lot of what's happening is you're defining this process, you're delivering the treatment, but don't forget about the part of uh, monitoring the patients and going back to the drawing board. So I only talked to you about the top half of the circle. There's a whole nother bottom half of the circle where after we've delivered the treatment, we're still learning and we're still going back to, you know, version two, version three, version four of these cell therapies. Um, and so for informational use only is also a powerful tool when it comes to that. The easiest way for you to fix if the product is research use only or CTS grade really has to do with like the, the lull we have, it's a limited use liability license, how can I use this? Or if you have the CTS branding on the product itself, the CTS branding is for, that signifies that it's 21 CFR compliant and then it has all that documentation that I talked to you about in the, in the second to last slide before the end. And then, you know, if you're really, if you're really wondering if it comes down to it, you know, just write to our tech support and they can help uh, support you with this. But but for the most part, um, everything that I presented to you is, is, is uh, intended for using in cell therapy, whether it be for informational use only or, or something else. And so <clears throat> hopefully our branding there is clear and helps you distinguish, but more than happy for us to have that conversation on the side too, if you have specific questions about specific products. 
Dr. Hexum, is Sendivirus used in the Cytotune reprogramming kit safe to use in cell therapy? And does it alter the host's genome? That's a really great question. So one of the cool things about Sendivirus is it doesn't integrate into the genome. And so that's one of the ways that it is a, a, a safer tool and mechanism to use for inducing pluripotent stem cell uh, for, for reprogramming your um, so, and that's also why I presented you that piece of information that you can measure the footprint as it's gone. So the send virus, while it's in there, it's going to help reprogram the cells, but then after, throughout the passages, it dilutes out. And so that's why it's really great to have that additional tool to show that the send virus is completely gone um, from, from the cells before you go on to utilize them for other purposes for whatever your downstream workflow is. That's a good question. Thank you, Dr. Hexton. Now, it looks like we're out of time. Do you have any final comments for our audience? No, I just want to thank you guys so much for attending the webinar. Um, I hope I was able to answer some questions. If not, please give us those questions in the, in the submission that you have there. I think uh, it's a, a really important thing for us to discuss this when it comes to characterization of the T cells and the cell therapy product. There's so much for us to learn together. Um, and th there's still so much to do in this field. And so let's continue the conversation together, submit those questions, contact your Thermo Fisher people, reach out on LinkedIn. We want to continue to have this conversation. Thank you so much for being a part of the webinar. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Hexum. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Those questions we were not able to answer today and those that are submitted during the on-demand period will be answered by Dr. Hexum and her team via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. I'd like to once again thank Dr. Tia Hexum for her time today, and I'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand, and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day.